Today on Uncommon Knowledge, do they really go together like a horse and carriage? Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Love and Marriage. The institution of marriage isn't what it used to be just, say, five decades ago. Divorce rates are dramatically higher. Many more children are being raised in single-parent homes, and lots of couples are choosing simply to live together without bothering to get married at all. Why have patterns of family life and marriage changed so much in five decades? What should the government do? What can the government do to strengthen the institution of marriage? Joining us, two guests. Stephanie Kuntz is a professor of history and family studies at Evergreen State College. She's the author of the new book, Marriage, a History. Jennifer Roback Morse is a fellow at the Hoover Institution. She's the author of the new book, Smart Sex, How to Find Lifelong Love in a Hookup World. And now, love and marriage. Dr. Samuel Johnson, referring to the remarriage of a friend after the death of the friend's first wife, quote, the triumph of hope over experience, close quote. As we begin the 21st century and all that we know about divorce rates, shifting marriage patterns, is it fair to say that, the, that retaining the ideal of marriage as a happy and stable relationship between one man and one woman would amount to a triumph of hope over experience, Stephanie? Well, I think one of the reasons that our divorce rate is so high is because we have so much higher hopes than people had of marriage in the past. Jennifer? I think we should be hopeful for lifelong married love. I think it's worth being hopeful for. The essence, the nature of marriage. Jennifer Roback Morris, I quote you to yourself, quote, Marriage is a naturally occurring pre-political institution that emerges spontaneously from society. Western society is drifting toward a redefinition of marriage as a bundle of legally defined benefits bestowed by the state. Explain yourself. Marriage has existed in some form or fashion in every known human society. If you think of marriage as being the normative institution where people have sex and raise children. Every society has some preferred place for people to have their babies and have sex. And it that, is not a creation of, of the, it's, of, of it's the not law. A, it's of the not a creation structure. of the state. It's a, it's, it's a creation. It's an organic institution that flows from the fact that men and women naturally are drawn to one another and couple and have an interest in their own children and okay. so on. Now let me quote you to, your stel to yourself. Stephanie Kuntz, quote, marriage has taken so many different forms in history that trying to define it does not really help us understand what any particular society's marriage system is or how and why such a system changes over time, close quote. Now, to me, the interesting, for the purposes of this, this discussion, the interesting part of that quotation is changes over time. Do you accept Jennifer's notion that marriage is pre-political, that it's organic, or would you argue more that society gets to make up or define marriage as it goes along? Well, my research suggests that um, it's certainly marriage developed before politics, but one of the most amazing and interesting things to learn about marriage in history is that throughout most of history until very recently, marriage was more about finding in-laws than it was about finding love between two individuals and raising the kids. Lots of kids were raised out of marriage in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of sex certainly took place out of marriage in the past, more actually probably than today. Um, but throughout most of history, marriage was an institution that was really important to social solidarities because it was the way you turned strangers into relatives. And women were referred to, uh, and some men too, as peace weavers. They were the ones who made peace between people. Here's now let's examine marriage in modern America more closely. Let me describe two developments of the 20th century, one legal and one demographic. I'll go as fast as I can here. <laughs> and then I'd like to ask you to tell me what they mean, how we should understand them. The legal event is the advent of no-fault divorce. 
Throughout most of American history, divorces could be obtained only when one party was pronounced guilty of serious misconduct, adultery, abandonment, that sort of thing. Uh, then in the 1970s, divorce law changes quite radically, permitting no-fault divorces. That is to say, if a couple wants to dissolve its marriage, it can simply claim that the marriage is broken down. There's no need for a court to engage in a finding of fault. The marriage is simply dissolved. The demographic event, rising divorce rates. The divorce rate is for a long time, d decades. Uh, when I say a long time, I mean decades. When you say a long time, you mean millennia. It's relatively stable at just under two divorces for each 1,000 Americans. During World War II, the divorce rate jumps, almost doubles, sinks back. By 1960, it's almost back where it started. Then it begins a very sharp climb, peaking in 1980 at more than five divorces for every 1,000 Americans. What do we make of these two developments? And the obvious question here is, is there some causality? Is the new and easier divorce regime in some way connected to a cause of the rising divorce rate that you see in the 70s and, and 80s? Go ahead, Stephanie. <laughs> well, first of all, your graph is not quite accurate. Divorce has been rising steadily since the 1870s. No sooner did people begin to believe in the idea that you should marry for love than many people began to say, well, if you fall out of love, you should have a right to divorce. Uh, as early as 1891, a you professor see, you at see Cornell... A, very, a, a kind of steady climb from 1870s? Uh, yeah, it goes like this. Here, I can do it for no, you. No, go ahead. It goes go like this from the eight, 1870s. It triples in the 1920s. You see it goes the down in the 1930s. It spikes in 1946. It goes down in the 1950s. But listen to this. But it could it rise never, sharply during oh, the Second World War. Absolutely. Okay. It never in the 1950s goes below its high point in the 1920s. It resumes its rate starting in about 1955. Okay, so everything you've stated so far is pre the new no fault yes, divorce right. regime. But right. here, so what I'm suggesting yeah. and what I think the evidence uh, supports is that no fault divorce was a reaction to other social changes that were increasing the divorce rate. What is interesting is that in the first five years after every state that adopted no-fault divorce did so, there was a spike. But then it, it faded. Subsides. You when you say, say it's, it's falling, causal. it's still much higher today oh, than absolutely. it was, say, absolutely. 1960. We're saving, we're, yes, we're okay. saving more marriages than we did in 1981. And my argument as a historian is that we can probably save a few more, but we will never, ever get back to the point where we can afford to ignore the fact that people are going to be parting, whether okay. we like it or not. Just, wh whatever, whatever graph you as subscribe, subscribe to, the divorce rate rises in the 20th century. What I'm do you not so worried about the graph, uh, the, the, the blips on the graph. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting point to me about the no-fault divorce right. innovation is, is two points. The first interesting thing is that I think no-fault is a kind of a misnomer because I think it's more accurate to say unilateral divorce meaning one person can end the divorce for any reason or no reason against the wishes of the other party. And that really is, I think, something new. And there are many injustices. New as of the 1970s. Yeah, that's, right. a, that's a relatively new way to approach it, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that one person can end the divorce without, end the marriage, sorry, without the consent of the other person, without even really offering an account of themselves. And there are many injustices and problems that flow from that that I don't think we're fully taking uh, into account. Mm -hmm. So there are many reluctantly divorced people out there. And, uh, and I think people, you know, we just need to just, simple justice says that we ought to pay more attention to them. What about the notion, Stephanie's notion, that the divorce rate rises through, well, you begin toward the end of the 19th century and continues rising through the 20th century. There's quite a lot of an increase in the divorce rate, very substantial increase in the divorce rate before exactly. the so-called no exactly. So I what's going on there? I think that's right. I think I, I suspect a number of things are going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is the change in the idea that you're supposed to be happy and we have rising expectations and then therefore we're disappointed and we think it's, it's time to, to end the thing. A lot of those flips, you can attract each one to a to a specific kind of demographic event like World War II. But I right. think probably the main thing is the mechanization of, of, uh, of, of the economy and families kind of not working together as, part, as an economic the, the unit. Need, uh, as an, it, Let me ask Stephanie to explain how the romantic ideal of marriage has fueled rising divorce rates. Thank Stephanie you. makes this very arresting assertion. I'm going to quote you again, Stephanie. The very things that, and ask you to explain it, the very things that made marriage more satisfying and increasingly fair to women are the same things that have made marriage less stable. Explain mm -hmm. that. 
Well, through, for centuries, marriage was an authority relation, not a love relationship. It was uh, defined by law right up until the 1979 was the year that the last American state repealed its head and master law. Before uh, that, until the 20th century, in the early 20th century, women were considered almost literally the property of their husbands. They didn't fight much. They didn't have anything to fight about. They didn't have any right to fight. Furthermore, they were economically dependent. Um, mm -hmm. As women have become... Um, have had more fairness in marriage, as there really is a more intimate and loving relationship, and as women have developed the economic independence, which incidentally gives them more clout within marriages and actually increases the happiness of mar many marriages, it makes it more possible to leave a marriage that they feel is unsatisfying. But, okay, so one part then is that women don't have to put up with bad marriages Correct. in the way that they once used Correct. to. They have recourse now. But don't you Can want I to argue that men also get to just leave their wives? Well, there's, a, there's also the other side of it, which is that the, the new innovations of, in divorce law make it possible for a vulnerable house, uh, homemaking wife to be abandoned for basically no reason or, or any reason. And so that, for the trophy that, wife. that for the trophy wife. Right. And, and both of those kinds of stories happen every day in our society. Can I say one thing sure, about Sure, of course. Of See, because as a historian, I think that there's always trade-offs in things. I agree that homemakers in particular were really made vulnerable, uh, although I would not want to uh, overestimate how happy they were under the fault-based divorce, which could have terrible, terrible abuses. But you know, one thing that people forget is that in the, every state that adopted no-fault divorce in the five years following, the suicide rate of wives fell by 20%. So, you know, some women were better off as a result of it, some were worse off. My argument would be that this is a long-range historical trend mm -hmm. that we will not wish away, so we'd better not learn how to build on its benefits and minimize its weaknesses. But it's also the case that today, divorced people have tri triple the uh, suicide rate of married people. So I, I th that's not really enough of an answer, I don't think. Let, let, let me, all right, so we have divorce. Now let me ask. Uh, what we ought to do about it. I'll quote you again, Jennifer. Quote, admit that unilateral divorce has undermined marriage. Current divorce law allows people to divorce for any reason or no reason, so lots of marriages dissolve against the wishes of one person. Many divorced people could be described as reluctantly divorced, close quote. So you want to reform divorce law, right? Yes, and there are many ways at the margin that one could do that. You don't have to go back to a full-fledged fault-based system to alleviate some of the issues give us that we a, have to here. give us one reform. well for instance so. for instance you can you can change with the custody laws you can have a rebuttable presumption of joint custody and the reason that's an important Hold issue on, explain what that means okay joint custody means that both parties that there's a presumption that both parties are going to be equally involved in the rearing of the children as opposed to the current presumption which is that the woman which varies state by state okay so this is oh, gen I see. Uh, okay but I, I, it does, isn't it the usual tendency is that the children stay with the mother that's the tendency right. that's the tendency but so, it's and increasing so, uh, the idea of joint custody is definitely that's, gained back. and the reason right. that's important is because it means that it, that, that somebody can't just uh, and uh, this gets to the issue of wives initiating mm -hmm. divorces they can't just say okay i'm taking the kids Maybe I'll get some child support and some alimony, but I don't have to put up with that guy anymore. Right. Because if you have joint custody, you've got to put up with the guy. You have to oh, still I work see. together. You see, you can't just have a free hand in the rearing of the kids. And so that, that I mean, that's one type of thing. That so you can so do the notion that, is changes. that the law, the law can, says to people, once you have children, you are engaged in a joint enterprise. For you, life. you don't have to live with that man any longer or with that woman. But you've got to get these kids through high school. That would be a very different kind of a message, I think, in some states. Now, that, as a, again, yeah. this is Stephanie. Such, very you say making state. divorce laws stricter would have little effect on the number of marriages that break down and might actually discourage some people from getting married in the first place. What do you think of the reform she just mentioned? Well, I think that sort of reform is quite possible. I'm, I'm in favor. You know, people say, oh, we have to reinstitutionalize marriage. Well, I think we also have to institutionalize divorce. We have to say to couples who divorce, you may be parting ways, but you, if you have kids together, you cannot walk away from those obligations. You both have to be involved. We should have and So you're a high, bit of a toughie yourself. We should then. have as high <laughs> expectations of divorced and unwed couples as we do of married couples. My objection... Next, the problem of broken families. We're dealing now with the question of broken families. Two specific questions. Welfare reform. The welfare reform that the, the Republicans in Congress enacted and Bill Clinton signed in 1994 says to a lot to working mothers, excuse me, says to single mothers in a way that the law did not before, you're going to have to get out and do your best to find a job. Mm -hmm. Taking you away from your kids. 
are you in favor of that reform? Or should moms, single moms, uh, many of them divorced, many of them never met, married in the first place, should they be permitted to stay home with their kids? How do you address that one? I think that's a really tough issue. I think that's a very tough issue. I think it's good for kids to have their parents have a work ethic. And we see, particularly with the welfare reform, that sending the mothers to work actually helps the preschool students. Oh, it does? Kids. Yes, it does. Oh, we have some yes, data on we that We have some now. data the on it. On off. the other hand, we have some other data, which is that at the older ages, when the kids are usually in very impoverished, high-crime neighborhoods and lose the supervision of the mom, that it older may ages, be a problem. Older ages, teens? Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. Pre-teens, so, latchkey kids, that's so, a bad thing. So these are all really complex problems. I'm not saying that there's, that we should just say, the notion, oh boy, this so, change is all for the good. So what, but what about this notion to which I think you've both now signed on, that if you've got kids, you need to be responsible for them. So doesn't well, that, uh, would it not then follow that you ought to go out and earn the money to put the bread on the table? Yes, what, Jennifer, what, what is your view of the welfare reform? I think on the whole that, that it was a good thing to, right. to insist on, on, on work as a condition of welfare or to, you know, to in, introduce that as part of the ethos. But I also think that it's important to reintroduce marriage as part of the ethos because I think that is a key to getting people out of poverty. A single person trying to do this on their own, it's really, really, really? hard. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that, that, that there's no such thing really as a single mother, that every mother has to have somebody helping her, whether it's the person she's married to or whether it's the state. And it's, because it's just too hard to do by yourself. And so, so how do you reintroduce marriage into the ethos? That's how do you do it? Question. How do you do it? Well, you know, one hates to say in Prayer the old and days. Prayer fasting, but I... You know, in the old days, <laughs> in, in, the, in, in the old days, social workers actually encouraged people to get married. You know, I mean, they actually said, you know, you got your kids need to get married. But they don't talk to people like that anymore. And in fact, we're tongue-tied about this. We're afraid to talk well, about Well, actually, that's, that's not true. They, we are spending uh, millions of dollars now promoting marriage. And, uh, and not a moment too have, soon. And I, have, yeah, yeah, okay. and I have nothing against uh, helping people get married, encouraging people to make better commitments and have healthier relationships. I do worry about this uh, marriage. What about the government doing that? Well, I think that, that I think it's fine if the government encourages. What I would say the government ought to promote is healthy relationships. I think really healthy relationships do tend to lead to marriage. But I think when you turn marriage into a fetish and you say, you know, everybody has these correlations, kids, uh, you know, people. Uh, married people are happier than divorced people. You're comparing apples and oranges. Happily married people don't divorce, okay? So unhappily married people are not happier than divorced people. Kids of married parents do better. That's because most married parents are cooperating parents. The now, wait, kid hold of on, a hold on, hold on, hold on. the kid of an unhappily conflict-ridden marriage does not do better. So you're promoting saying, marriage in the abstract. You're saying promote healthy relationships, yes. and, and Jennifer, I believe, is saying. No, not good enough. There is something oh, distinctive about marriage. Is and that I not think correct? That's right. And I think that's right. I think what you just said is really quite misleading, if I may say so. I think, well, I think that I think that um, that that the people who do these statistical studies take into account the income levels and health levels and other all other kinds of things. To, to deal with the fact that, yes, you might have a different pool of people who get divorced rather than those who get married. Same with living together. It's a little bit different kind of person who lives together than who gets married. But even taking all that into account, there does seem to be something different about marriage versus cohabiting or versus divorce. And so I... Let's see what our guests think of C.S. Lewis's proposal for two kinds of marriage. C.S. Lewis, famous British... Uh, academic and also Christian apologist. Now, Lewis is talking about Christian notions of marriage, but I think we can substitute the word traditional and it works just as well. Quoting C.S. Lewis, how far should Christians, or for our purposes, say not Christians, but those who believe in traditional marriage, force their views of marriage on the rest of the community? My own view, says C.S. Lewis, is that there ought to be two distinct kinds of marriage, one governed by the state with rules enforced on all citizens, the other governed by the church, or we can say any other religious institution, with rules enforced by the church on its own members. This distinction ought to be quite sharp so that a man knows which couples are married in a Christian or, for our purposes, traditional sense, and which are not, close quote. So Stephanie gets healthy relationships. That's all the state asks for or encourages. And you get 
a separate system of widely recognized church or synagogue or mosque marriages, which are held to a different standard. I don't think that quite gets, I don't think Lewis's distinction gets quite at what Stephanie is concerned about or what the dispute between us has to do with, because he's, he's talking about, he's still talking about marriage. He's not talking about cohabiting. And she's talking about cohabiting being different even from a civil marriage, if I understand her correctly. So I think we still have to deal with this question of cohabiting. And we also have to deal with the question of conflict in marriage. And I think the real innovation mm -hmm. in the last 30 years has been what people in low-conflict marriages do. You see, if there's, a high, if there's domestic violence, if there's infidelity, if there's alcoholism, those were grounds, those were traditionally grounds for fault-based divorces. Those were always grounds for divorce. Yeah, yeah, those were grounds for fault-based What's new, and the research does show that in a conflict, a high-conflict marriage, the kids are better off if the parents divorce, that's right. for sure. But it's the low-conflict marriage where all the innovation, I think, has really happened, where there's kind of low-level dissatisfaction between the parties. The, the research on that shows that when those marriages dissolve, it's very upsetting to the children. They half the time are clueless, don't even know their mom and dad are upset. It's an unwelcome intrusion into their lives. And those are the kids who, when you say the kids do worse after a divorce, those are the kids where you really can parse out and see Tell the Tell me your reform. Well, it, how do you change that? You see, that, that's an area I think where the expectations, the social expectations is really quite important because I think a lot of people don't just stay together because of what the law says, but because is, is it socially acceptable to get divorced? And I think now that both custom and the law more or less favors personal autonomy over the unit of the marriage. Right. And that, I think, is a work not only of law, but also of the culture. So your answer to this, culture is something, of course, that's extremely difficult for the government to get its of hands course. on. You're yeah. not suggesting a plan on which George W. Bush can act. You're suggesting no, but, that but, people like you ought to state the, the importance of marriage that bit by bit, that's a big part of the it. Culture but you can also concern. do you can also do modest reforms like waiting periods and things like that. You know, and, uh, European countries, a lot of them have waiting periods for divorce and, and so on. And that's several, not the end of the we world. We have several states in America who are experiencing uh, experimenting with covenant marriages where people can choose to give up their right to a no-fault divorce. Oh. Now, if you were Who's, the three, what states? A couple down. Oh, Louisiana, Louisiana Oklahoma. Tell me how that works. Uh, that you can you can <laughs> sign an uh, essentially a prenuptial saying, I give up my right to a no-fault divorce. We will only get a divorce in the case of adultery, felony, or two years separation. So you could say, in effect, I choose to, we choose to right. permit this yes. marriage to be governed by 19th century yes. divorce yeah, laws. Exactly. exactly, exactly. Now, here's the problem. Any research on how those marriages do? Um, too, too early, too early. Too early. Okay. But there is research on how many people choose them. No, no, no. And it's okay. less than 3%. Yeah, no, no, no. And I guess my message here is, you know, in the ideal world, everybody would just have these wonderful, lovely, healthy relationships that would probably end in marriage. In the real world, adults today spend half their life, adult life, out of marriage. Um, people, marriage no longer regulates the entry into sex. Your age of first marriage is over 25 for women, over 27 for men. No society in history has ever kept that age group celibate. And in the real world, 40% of kids will end up, whether I like it or not, and I don't particularly like it, spending some part of their life in a family so form So what do you want to do? You want to just say, look, just accept it. So I want us not to prejudge. No divorce is here to I, I want us to say, not say in advance, that, OK, only married couples can make it. I think that we have to figure out a way of simultaneously helping people enter and sustain marriages and extending a helping hand to those people who are choosing or have been forced into other ways. We're out of time, I have to ask. Finally, predictions on the future of the institution of marriage. 25 years ago, roughly two marriages, this is 1980, roughly two marriages out of every five ended in divorce. Today that figure stands at about one in three, a little over one in three. So it's down from 1980, 1980 was the peak. 25 years from now, where will that figure stand? I think it will be about the same, but that instead of marriage coming back, you will continue to have cohabitation. I think that we are actually have the possibility of saving really healthy marriages, doing a better job of that, but that we will never get rid of these cohabiting right, then and Let me ask forms. you a second. So actually, go ahead. What's your answer to that? The I divorce it, rate does what? I think it will be lower because the young people coming of age today 
are sick of the divorce culture because they've already been through two or three divorces by the time they get to college. Their parents' yeah, divorces. Their, their, their parents' divorces. They've lived through it. I hear from these people And the answer every to day. that will not simply be that they refuse to get married? They're sick of it. They're sick of it. They want to get married and stay married. Right. They don't know how, Second, but that's what they want to try. Today, in the United States, by the age of 65, 95% of Americans have been or are married. And the question is, 10 years from now, what will that figure be? Are there going to be more Americans just staying out of marriage? I don't think that the rate of non-marriage is going to rise significantly. Americans are marrying people much more so than many other countries. The Japanese, for example, have much higher rates of singles than we do. So mm -hmm. do the Italians. In fact, one of the things that's interesting is that in many of the countries where divorce is hard to get, people are staying away from marriage in droves. So I think that that that's a statistic will remain about the same. Will remain in marrying people. I think so. Americans are hopeful people, and so we will remain a married ah, people. Yes. All right. The triumph of hope, at least, if not over experience of hope. Two or itself. three times are necessary, unfortunately. <laughs> Stephanie Kuntz, Jennifer Robeck Morris, thank you very much. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.